Hello and welcome to Murrayfield and me. My name is Bruce Aitchison and I am Mr. Eggshaped from Happiness is Eggshaped. I have lots of stories to tell. I like to talk and I figured what better thing to talk about than the place I love, Murrayfield Stadium, where I've been going for a very, very long time. So this is part of a series of me and Murrayfield and my stories of my times there as a player, believe it or not, once, as a coach, as a supporter, as an announcer, as a host for hospitality for Edinburgh Rugby and for Scotland, and all those times where I just took any excuse to drive past the stadium that feels a bit like a church. It's a place of worship. It is a place that I go out of my way to drive past and to visit, and I go there for any excuse at all. I've told people before that I could sit in the stand and I could watch the grass grow. I've been to Murrayfield a million times and when my friend moved back from Hong Kong and said, I'm thinking about going to Murrayfield to do the stadium tour, I said, yeah, I'll come with you. And I absolutely loved it. And the tour guide was a legend of Scottish rugby, a guy I know, and he said, you could be doing this tour. And I said, I know, and when I retire, I hope I will be. But until then, I'm just going to tell my story of Murrayfield and me. Now, the one that sticks out, and although I'd been to Murrayfield before, the game that is the game, and I don't think there is anything that's going to happen in my lifetime to beat it. My one regret is that I was so young. And I'm not sure I appreciated it at the time, but with my rose tinted spectacles on, looking back, I can just tell how important a day that was. The stadium, I think, held at the time 70,000 people, 60,000 people. If you believe everybody that tells you they were there, the capacity, I think, was about 350,000. The game I'm talking about, of course, was in 1990 when Scotland beat England to win the Grand Slam. And it was a fairy tale. I'd been at the French game when we'd won. We'd beaten Ireland and we'd beaten Wales away. And it all came down to this match, the match that books have been written about. I'm not sure if there's a movie, but there's definitely documentaries. And I loved it. At the time, I was at Stow Primary School, a little village primary school in the borders. The borders is the heartland of rugby in this country, or it certainly was then. There was internationals galore from the borders, and we took great delight in supporting the club teams on a Saturday afternoon and then supporting these ordinary working class men who would then turn out for Scotland on the Saturday afternoon in what was the biggest rugby tournament in the world. The World Cup had kicked off, but it still wasn't quite there yet. Scotland had had a heap of players on the British Lions Tour in 1989, and 1990 was a golden era. The team was stacked, and there were heroes like Gary Armstrong and Craig Chalmers, who were young borders men who were doing it for Scotland on that world stage. And it all came down to this one game. Winner takes all, the Grand Slam for England or the Grand Slam for Scotland. And of course, we were the underdogs. So at Stow Primary School with the pack lunch in the back of the council minibus that didn't have seats facing forward, it was two bench seats down the side of the minibus. And when Mr. Jones slammed on the brakes, everybody would pile up at the front of the minibus. And we had such a good time and we loved to sing Flower of Scotland because it was just beginning to come into our consciousness. So I think we sang it all the way up the road. Pug Mason, Bun Cunningham, Katie, everybody on the bus to go and support Scotland. And there we were in the front benches that was called the schoolboy enclosure that are no longer there. Tickets were four pounds, I think. And there we were sitting there watching history unfold. But at the time, we didn't know it. And the terrace in behind us was swaying. And we were there, and the England team ran out, and then it happened. The place exploded. And it was difficult to see what it was. But David Soule, the Scotland captain, walked out.
as slow as you like with his team behind him ready to go into what they had built up to be a battle and they stood for the national anthems and then it was on and you could just feel the intensity and I've watched it back a hundred times so at the time I probably didn't feel it and at the time I probably didn't see it and smell it and sense it but when I watch it back it just gets there and then there's the scrum and Pick up by Jeffrey. Jeffrey to Armstrong. Armstrong to it goes to Gavin Hastings who was at the time huge was monumental and he kicked and there goes Tony Stanger. Now, Tony Stanger is a hero of mine. And Tony Stanger worked for the Royal Bank of Scotland. And he worked in Gala Shields. And when I got to secondary school and went to Gala Shields Academy, on a Friday, I used to take all the change from my dinners through the week. And on a Friday afternoon, I would go into the bank and I would queue in the Royal Bank of Scotland on Bank Street in Gala Shields. But there was one teller that I wanted to serve me. So I would let people go in front of me to go because I wanted to be served by Tony Stanger, Scotland International, the man who scored the try for Scotland to win the Grand Slam against England in 1990. And he would serve and then he would go and play for Hoik at the weekend. And then he was missing on the Thursday and Friday before internationals because he was away with the Scotland team. And I luckily got to meet Tony Stanger years later. And I used to, I said to him, I used to let people go in front of me so that I could be served by you. And he said, yeah, that happened a lot. But it was always wee boys for some reason. It was never pretty ladies. And it just made me laugh. And it's amazing that I can speak to someone who had such a huge impact on not just me, but on the country at that point to show that we could do it, we Scotland could do it. And Tony Stanger dotted that ball down that I think some people are still claiming he didn't dot down. And when you listen back to it now and you hear Bill McLaren's commentary, Bill McLaren from Hoyk, where Tony Stanger is from, who had coached Tony Stanger, it just makes the hairs on the back of your neck stand up because he did it and I was there and so was Bill, who couldn't have been happier. Now, whenever we'd gone to an international, Mr. Jones, our legendary head teacher at Stowe Primary School, would not let you invade the pitch. Of course he wouldn't, because what would happen if you got swept up or taken away or trampled on in that huge mass of humanity? They wanted to go and just touch a Scotland international rugby player. But this time we were allowed on. We were allowed on to the dead ball area. And I can remember me and my primary school buddies ripping up grass and putting it in our pockets so we could take home a wee bit of Murrayfield. We could take home something that we thought was going to last forever. We didn't want the grass to last forever. Of course we didn't. What we wanted was that feeling. We wanted that memory to last forever. And on the way back, as we walked through some of the streets around Murrayfield back to the minibus, we couldn't have been happy. I had no clue about the line out or the scrum or the tactics or that Finlay Calder did that or that Damien Cronin did that or that Sticks Turnbull had to come on as re and replace Derek White. I didn't understand any of that stuff, but what I did understand was the feeling and it was amazing. And then the newspaper that came out on a Saturday night was called The Pink. It was the pink newspaper and it was printed in the city in Edinburgh and then it would be driven out to the country. And that was the thing that we used to do on a Saturday night. Bruce, go and get the pink from the post office. So on my bike, I would cycle to the other end of the village for the post office to open so that people could buy the pink. And that was how we knew what had happened in the football for Hibs and for Hearts, the Edinburgh teams on the Saturday afternoon. And I can remember clutching that Grand Slam pink newspaper because I was there. I was there. And when I watch it back, I try and find myself in the crowd. And of course, it's impossible. There was no social media. I've not got a selfie. There's nothing to prove it other than my ticket and my program, a full heart and a head full of memories. That was probably the beginning of the love affair with that stadium that has changed and it's grown and it's developed. But every time I go back, I'm just filled up with another bit of Murrayfield and me. My name is Bruce Aitchison and you've been listening to Murrayfield and me.
my love story about me and my place of worship.